All right, well, I guess I'll be pinned to the microphone. How's that? All right, so today we're going to be talking about something that I'm, I'm honestly really excited about. It is something very new and interesting with Hyperion planning and something that I hope I can convince all of you to uh, at least go out there and play around with and, and try it out. My name is Jake Turrell, and I'm a Hyperion planning and S-Space consultant. And I've basically been doing nothing but implement S-Space planning PBCS for about the past two decades, long time. So i um, been doing this a long time. I spend my days out at client sites. So I'm a consultant, and I, I implement this stuff you know, every day. Today we're going to be talking about the planning rest API. And notice that I didn't say the PBCS REST API. We're going to be showing you a demo today that uh, uses on-prem, but most everything I'm going to show you, in fact, everything I'm going to show you and more will work with PBCS. Uh, we're going to go through a brief introduction. We're going to talk about the API itself, what it can do and what it can't do. We'll talk about some of the differences between on-prem and cloud. And then we're going to get into some of the nuances, just a little bit of background information on some things you need to know to be able to get the REST API to work well. Okay, then we'll go through a couple of resources, and then we're going to get straight to a live demo. So pray to the demo gods that this goes well, but uh, it's a live demo. I am running planning on my laptop, so uh, we'll be working with on-prem planning, on-prem on my laptop. <clears throat> All right, so how many of you guys are REST programmers? How many of you have used a REST API, uh, done anything like that before? Two hands, good. You don't have to be a REST programmer to do this. If you read the documentation, it's actually a little bit intimidating. It makes it sound like you've gotta be some sort of hacker extraordinaire to get this stuff to work. That is not the case. This presentation is gonna give you everything you need to get started programming with the REST API, and hopefully integrating external websites with Hyperion planning. So what is REST? REST is basically an architectural style, and it happens to be the architectural style of the World Wide Web. And it stands for Representational State Transfer, which I think is a horrible name because who knows what that means. What it really means is that you can have clients talking to servers without having a whole lot of information about the API and the structure of the API. And if you build your websites in a manner that can work with REST APIs, it's said to be RESTful, okay? You're gonna hear that term. And basically, it's a fairly straightforward API. It's not a low-level API like the S-based Java API. You're gonna issue what are called requests to planning with one of four verbs, get, put, post, and delete, okay? And we're gonna show you all the things that you can do with those four verbs. Here's the interesting thing. Hyperion Planning has a REST API. So do thousands of other websites. There are thousands of REST APIs out there. And if you wanna integrate data and metadata from these other websites into planning, you can do it. You just have to learn a little bit about the other REST API, and then we can get planning talking to other websites. Now, notice I said the Hyperion Planning Simplified Interface has a REST API. I didn't say the old interface. What that means is when we're issuing REST requests, we're actually talking to the simplified interface. It also means you have to be on version 11.124. So if you're not on 11.124, you're not going to have the simplified interface. The simplified interface, people get really excited about, oh, it looks really good, and I can use it on a tablet. Those are not the exciting things about the simplified interface. The exciting part about the simplified interface is that it's RESTful, and we can hit it with an API, unlike the old interface. Uh, there are a lot of other EPM products out there that have REST APIs right now. If you've ever worked with application, or with PBCS, application management, which is basically LCM, lifecycle management for PBCS, it has its own REST API. The BI Cloud Service has its own REST API, and I know there are other REST APIs out there that Oracle just hasn't documented yet, 
uh, and they probably will get around to it. So there's other stuff out there. I believe FDMEE might have something. I've seen some blog posts on that. When we access the REST API, we're going to use a programming language. We'll talk about that in a minute. And we basically take the REST API and we create a request. We can create that request to Hyperion Planning or other third-party websites. We can basically talk back and forth between those sites to integrate them. But here's the cool part. The cool part is that you can use any number of programming languages. If you like Python, use Python. If you like COBOL, I bet there's even a REST client out there for COBOL. My personal preference, the demos you're going to see today, they were written uh, in Groovy. However, uh, if you're just starting out, Groovy is pretty good. And I would also recommend PowerShell. There, there are a lot of blog posts on both of those two. So those are really the two most common that I see. We're definitely using scripting languages here. I don't know if I would personally go out there and write a Java program with a REST API, but Groovy is basically a scripting version of Java, and it's a whole lot easier. So I recommend Groovy and, and PowerShell. All right, so the website we're going to be talking to today is a website called Open Exchange Rates. And the reason I picked Open Exchange Rates is a lot of our applications use foreign exchange rates, right? And the nice thing about Open Exchange Rates is they, well, A, for 12 bucks a month, you can get 10,000 requests, which as a developer is more than enough for me. Um, I can get historical rates. I can get current rates. I can get rate metadata, names and descriptions. And the nice thing about it is they have a really well-documented API. So on their website, they tell you, okay, if you're writing a program, here's how you talk to us, okay? But like I said, it is literally one of thousands of websites you can go hit. So we're going to be using this today. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the REST API itself. The REST API basically lets us do five things. It lets us manage jobs, work with members, get applications, manage planning units, and get user preferences. And you look at that and you go, man, five things. That's not very much. But what you don't realize is that very first bullet, manage jobs, lets you do a whole heck of a lot in Hyperion planning. So jobs are definitely key. And I, I, I created these jobs in the simplified interface. Um, so in my code, you'll see I do nothing to create jobs. I just reference jobs that I manually set up in the, in the simplified interface, and they're very, very easy to set up. With a job in the simplified interface, now you can get start doing some really interesting stuff. You can import and export data. You can import and export metadata. You can load data. You can play around with planning units. You can refresh a database. You can do all sorts of things. Run plan type maps if you're doing that sort of thing, mapping between BSO and ASO cubes. So. Jobs are really the key to this whole process, okay? Without jobs, you know, five things, we'd be fairly limited. But with those five things, we can do a lot. All right, let's talk a little bit about on-premises versus cloud. First of all, right now today, the REST API is supported for PBCS on the cloud, but not for on-premises. However, in talking uh, to the Oracle folks, my understanding is that it will be supported later this year, sometime around December, give or take, okay? The fact that it's not supported obviously didn't stop me. It works. We're going to show you some of the things that don't work, though. And uh, some of those are, for example, I mentioned before, application management. Application management doesn't really exist for on-prem, so we can't use that REST API. You'll see later on that instead of that, we're going to use an FTP site, which works pretty well, too. Um, the last thing, how many of you guys have worked with EPM Automate? Okay. Did any of you know that is actually built on the REST APIs? So you can see the extent of you know, real software that you can start to build with this product. But like I said, everything you're going to see today is running off my laptop. It's on-prem. I would argue that it is even easier to do this stuff with PBCS because you have more features and, and functions available. All right, so how do we create a REST request? We're going to need two things, usually, to create a REST request. We're going to need to authenticate for some resources, but not all. 
For example, let's say I just want to go out and I want to issue a request and say, hey, Hyperion Planning, what version of the API are you using? That does not require authentication. But if I want to go out and run a job or run a business rule or do anything like that, we're obviously going to have to authenticate. On top of that, I'm going to need some instructions. And those instructions are usually made up of one of four things, or actually three of four things at least. We've got to give it a URL because what are we doing? We're talking to a website with code, right? We're going to need a request type. Remember we talked about the four verbs before? We're going to need to tell it, what do you want to do with that URL? Sometimes we're going to need a payload, but not always. And a payload is a, usually a JSON structure. Everybody knows what JSON is, right? You can write JSON in your sleep. Don't worry about that. I, it's, it's a scary word, and when I first started looking at it, I thought, oh, God, I'm going to have to learn to do XML by heart or something crazy like that. It's super easy. We'll get to that. But, ah, does it have to be a JSON payload? No, not always. It depends on the feature. Yeah, you can use text. You could, there's a number of things you're going to use. In fact, JSON for on-prem doesn't always work, and so you're going to see how I used uh, text instead. I've got an example of that. Um, and by the way, when I say something doesn't work, please understand I have not patched this to the latest patches. It is entirely possible that this stuff does work with later patches. So, you know, we'll, we'll talk about what didn't work for me and some others, uh, but, you know, it may work. It may work if you patch up your environment. So the payload is going to bring your request extra information it needs. So let's say you create a request and in that request, you're telling Hyperion Planning, hey, I want you to go run a job. Well, you're going to have to tell planning what that job type is and what the job name is. That is a payload. It's just a bit of information required to execute your request. And we'll talk about the JSON structure here in a minute. Then we're going to give it a content type. And that content type basically says, you're going to give me information back, and here's the format I want it in. And I usually like to get that content back in JSON as well because... There's, honestly, there's nice little parsers that we can use with Groovy. Okay? Yeah, it could be, there's actually, there's a bunch of content types, and uh, I'll show you in a little bit where you can go get sample code that Oracle has written for you, and there are all kinds of different content types in there. So JSON. JSON, like I said, it was like, when I started using the REST API, I thought, oh, I'm going to have to go learn some really cryptic technical thing. It is just a way to pass lists and arrays between websites. And you'll, you'll know when you see JSON, it's usually enclosed in curly brackets. You're going to have some text that's separated by colons and commas. It's just a way to pass lists around. Now, it can get a little more complex than this because you can have lists embedded within lists, you know, kind of like arrays of arrays. But seriously, there's not much to it. Okay? It looks like the text over there on the right. Stands for JavaScript Object Notation, by the way, if, you, if you're wondering. All right, authentication. When we authenticate uh, using the REST API and Hyperion Planning, we're going to create two variables. The first one is just going to store our user ID and our password, separated by a colon. Uh, the second one, we're going to take that information and we're going to encode that so that the API can interpret it. Uh, it's a little bit different for PBCS than it is for on-premises. With PBCS, you have to put your identity domain first. So it's identity domain dot username colon password. For on-prem, just username password with a colon. Okay. And we're going to show you this, what this looks like in Groovy here in just a second. <clears throat> All right, resources. You're going to hear us talk about resources quite a bit. And when we use the word resources, what we're really talking about is a URL where we can go get some information or do something. So you'll see up here we've got the URLs for the on-prem uh, REST API as well as the PBCS REST API. And you'll notice at the end it's got the version number. The version for on-prem, at least on my version, is 11.124. Now I've been told by developers V3, which they use on PBCS, should work. It doesn't work on my instance, but if I patched it, yeah, maybe it would. So the REST API for PBCS and on-prem, they're supposed to be pretty much the same. I just found a couple of things that are different, but again, could be patching. All right, 
So these resources that we're talking about are usually broken up into two or three things. We've got this base URL that says, here's my main URL that I'm gonna be talking to. And then they tag these little endpoints on it. And so, you know, for planning, that endpoint might be jobs. It could be dimensions. It depends on which parts of the application we're gonna be inter interacting with. Other REST APIs sometimes require a parameter at the end, and you'll see that open exchange rates that we're gonna be talking to, it requires a key at the end, and you get that key when you sign up for the service. It basically authenticates you and says, yeah, as long as I keep paying my 12 bucks a month, they'll keep feeding me exchange rates. So remember that combination of base URL and endpoints. It's a pretty common theme throughout most REST APIs. All right, so let's get into the example. We are going to be using Groovy today. If you haven't ever used Groovy, there's a link to download it right there. And you'll see there are different installers down in the bottom. The Windows installer is the one on the right. Click that, download it, and perform a fairly standard installation. It's literally next, next, next. It's a super easy install. Once we've got Groovy installed, we can start coding. All we need is access to the internet. So a couple of key aspects of the Groovy console. You can see there's a button there to save the script, a button to execute the script. You can interrupt a script that's running. The big white section in the middle is where you actually put your code. And then there's a little output section down at the bottom. And that output section is really useful for using print lines so that you can say, ah, what is this variable? You know, just basically debugging your code. So you can always output stuff to that console down on the bottom. So here's what our demo starts out like. And I'm going to actually, we'll, uh, we'll see if I can connect to my app here. And we'll show you what this looks like. I've got, I've got basically a, uh, let's see here, all right. So notice I'm connecting to the simplified interface here. For our purposes here, it doesn't really matter, but. By the way, if you're not using the simplified interface yet and you have 11124, I'd highly recommend it. First of all, I like it a lot better. And second of all, it really is the future direction of the product, so I'd encourage you to kind of start getting used to the simplified interface. So I'm gonna sign into my application. And again, this is accessing on-prem planning on my laptop. And I've just got a simple form. Nope, this is my application, I gotta pick my app. We obviously wouldn't pick our app in PBCS. I'm gonna go to the plans and open a form. And you'll notice this is a sad form. This form has no data, it has no metadata. There's really only one account in the entire application. Kind of pretty sad, right? Our whole objective here is we're gonna reach out to open exchange rates, grab some metadata, load up some data, and come back to this form after we run it and see it populated, right? That's, that's what we wanna do. We wanna interact with other websites. But before we get to that, I do wanna walk you through some code. And I'm gonna try to make this as painless as possible, but we are gonna walk through a little bit of code here. Uh, hopefully you've all got printouts so that if you can't see the code up here, I know it's kind of hard to see, uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, look at the printouts. All right, so here are the steps we're gonna follow in the demo. We're gonna reach out to open exchange rates and we're gonna grab some exchange rate metadata. This is basically the three digit, three character codes of the exchange rates and their aliases. Then we're gonna take that data, spit it into a file, upload it to an FTP site, and import it into Hyperion Planning. Now, why are we using the FTP site again? Well, when you create a job in the simplified interface, you can't really load data from your local computer because who knows where you're gonna be running that job, right? You can load from application management, but only for PBCS, or an FTP site. Well, since we're on-prem, we've gotta load from an FTP site. So we're gonna FTP that dimension build file up and then pull it into planning. Then we're gonna go back to open exchange rates and we're gonna grab all of the historical exchange rates from January of this year through the current month. 
Then we're going to take those files and load them up. And then we're going to open up our form that used to be empty. And if the demo gods have cooperated, we will uh, we'll see some data. All right, so some caveats. Obviously, we're using an FTP site, like I said, because we can't use application management. There are a couple of functions that I was not able to get to accept JSON as a payload. And I'll be honest, I got it to work on PBCS, and I couldn't get it to work on on-prem, and I thought I was going crazy. But luckily, John Goodwin had a nice blog post out there where he ran into the same thing. So I don't think I'm crazy. It doesn't work. But I bet if I patched my environment, it might be fixed, OK? So instead of passing it JSON, we're just going to pass it a string. I wrote a different function, and it works great. So there are workarounds for this. The other thing is, when you launch a job in Hyperion Planning with a REST API, you really ought to sit there and pull it and go, are you done yet? Are you done yet? And as soon as it's done, move to the next step. I was already dragging you guys through a fair amount of code, and I didn't want to add to that. So I just put a sleep in there to wait for my data restructure. So obviously, I can't just do my dim build and start loading data right away, because my restructure is probably still running. So I cheated admittedly, and just threw a sleep code in there. But if you're going to do this the real way, um, I would sit there and pull the job to say, are you finished restructuring? And then move on to the data load. And if you want an example of that, I've got an example on my blog. So a uh, couple other things. Um, did you guys know top is a reserved word in Hyperion planning? I didn't. So yeah, I apologize for anyone from Tonga. I could not upload your FX rates, because top is a reserved word. Now, we could, in real life, we'd probably prefix this, but it's a demo. So you'll see in my demo where I'm excluding certain exchange rates, and that's why. All right, we are not all of this from scratch. We're going to take advantage of a handful of pre-built libraries. Um, I didn't want to build FTP functionality from scratch, but the nice thing about you know, Java and Groovy is there's all these libraries out there that you can go reference. So I'm pulling in some libraries to help me with FTPing a file up to the site. I'm pulling in a couple of libraries to help me parse JSON. And then I'm also pulling in some uh, libraries to help me format dates. Because we're going to pull in dates, you know, data from January through the current month. I've got to be able to present those dates in a couple of different formats. Yes, question. That's a good question. As long as you can get Groovy to work with Secure FTP, the question was, sorry, I should always repeat these questions, um, would Secure FTP work? I am pretty sure it would. The question is, can Hyperion Planning jobs load from a Secure FTP website? I bet you can, because when you create that job, you supply the credentials. That's a good, I can, I can play around with that later and get you a definitive answer, but I suspect it would work. All right, so the very first lines of code we're going to write are just declaring some variables. And so we're going to declare some variables to interact with open exchange rates. So we've got a base path. This is the website that gets you to the open exchange rates REST API. And then we've got a series of endpoints. And those endpoints just provide different information. Latest provides me with the latest exchange rates. Currencies gets me a list of metadata. The historical endpoint gets me my historical rates, as long as I pass it a date. And then I've got that app ID, which again, I got that app ID when I signed up for the service. And then we've just got a list of exchange rates we're going to exclude. All right. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Oh, here's uh, some variables that define my FTP server. I just basically enabled an FTP server on my little VM up here. Works like a charm. Um, that's my password. Please don't hack my FTP site. Um, and then there's the name of the data file and the metadata file down at the bottom. Then we're going to declare some variables for interacting with on-prem Hyperion planning. So we've got the Hyperion planning URL, my user ID, password, the API version, which again for PBCS would be v3, although you should keep checking that because you never know when they're going to upgrade it, um, and then the application name. Down at the bottom, you'll see those two variables that I declared to store my credentials. I've got the username, colon, password, 
And then beneath that, I'm basically encoding that user ID and password. Now, I didn't just sit down and say, you know, I ought to encode this, and I think I'll use print base 64 binary. I honestly don't even know what that means. This code is provided for us in the sample code from Oracle, and it works perfectly. So I'll show you where that sample code is in a little bit, by the way. And here we go, the sample code. If you haven't been out to this website, in the PBCS documentation, remember I said this is only documented for PBCS now. That'll probably change, but there's a whole set of functions that Oracle has developed for you called the common helper functions. And here's the really cool part. They didn't just develop them in Groovy. You've got like four languages out there where they have helped you with these pre-built functions that help you interact with planning. Um, well, they help you interact with PBCS. We had to modify them just a little bit to work with on-prem, but it's a huge leg up, extremely helpful, and uh, if you haven't checked those out, it's, it's like you're getting a lesson in Groovy. I mean, it's, it's some really good code, so definitely something you should check out. I'm only using two of those common helper functions, and you literally just copy them and paste them into your code. Uh, while I'm only using two, though, there are lots of other good functions out there. Specifically, check out the ones that help you monitor job status. Uh, because, like I said, I'm kind of cheating here for the, for the purposes of keeping this simple. All right, so our very first function. This first function is going to actually reach out to open exchange rates. It's going to take the URL. If it's a bad URL, it will catch it. And otherwise, it's going to launch this function called execute request. And here's what I love about the common helper functions. This is one of the common helper functions, but I'm not even using it to access Hyperion planning. I can use that function to access other websites. So Oracle has given us this code. I'm gonna take it and use it everywhere, right? So what this does is it, this actually executes a REST request. We take the URL for open exchange rates, we say get. I don't need a payload because I'm not passing it anything. I just want it to send me back the the rate metadata, and that's what this endpoint does. And I'm telling open exchange rates, I want you to provide me with this data in a JSON format, okay? Just a nice format that I can take and parse with Groovy, okay? The next function is we're gonna take this metadata that we've gotten from open exchange rates, and we're gonna take it and just spin it into a file that Hyperion Planning can import. So this function, I know it looks like a fair amount of code, Really, all it does is format a text file, right? Nothing very fancy here. You'll see at the very bottom, I've got the name of the file dot append, and then it drops in all my metadata in the right order, okay? Before that, you're gonna see the term slurper all over the place. If you've, ever, if you've never worked with Groovy, there are all kinds of slurpers out there. There's a config file slurper, there's a JSON slurper. All those functions do, and again, they're pre-built, they're in the libraries that we referenced before, all they do is they take data in a particular format and read it into an easy to use text format. Okay, they read it into variables or a text file. So we get that data, metadata from open exchange rates, we spin it onto a file, and at that point that file lives on my laptop. Okay, we haven't uploaded it to the FTP site yet. Now I'm gonna do the exact same thing with the data load file. Okay, so I'm gonna reach out to open exchange rates again and I'm gonna create the data file. We've got the metadata file already, now we're writing a function to get the data. I haven't executed anything yet, I've just built some functions that we're gonna reference later. So nothing has really happened yet. After that, we're gonna write a function that helps us execute a job for on-prem. If you're using PBCS, just use the function in the common helper functions. But because I couldn't get this to accept JSON format in terms of the job type and the job name. I had to pass it a string to get it to work, so I had to write just a quick function to get around that. So if you're using on-prem, you might wanna take this approach. Try JSON first if you're patched. It might work. On mine it didn't, didn't work on John Goodwin's either, but uh, luckily John provided a workaround. And that workaround is we just pass it a string. You'll see uh, when we define the function at the top, that job info thing, we're just gonna pass it a string later on. It says, here's the job type, here's the job name, go to town. Uh, 
Uh, that's a really good question. The credentials are actually stored in the request header. So back up at the beginning when we, def when we define those, uh, those, uh, those two variables to store our user ID and the, the encoded version, it basically puts that into the header of our requests. Good question. The question was, why don't I see anything about user ID and password here? All right. So the next code, this is just code that, honestly, you don't have to write this. You can Google this. All you have to do is Google, how do I FTP files with Groovy? You'll find something that looks very similar to this. It connects to the FTP site with your credentials, uploads a file, disconnects. All right, the next code is we're actually going to reference the functions that we wrote previously. So this is where we're gonna tell open exchange rates, go run that function that builds my dim build file. Then in line 197, go FTP it up to the site. Then in line 198, go execute the job that imports this file from the FTP site. That's as easy as it is. I mean, everything we've been doing up to this point was just so we can execute three lines of code. Not much to it. And then I'm gonna get lazy and I'm gonna sleep here until my, my restructure finishes. All right, next I need some calendar functions because now I'm gonna start loading data. So next, I'm gonna declare some calendar functions so that I can have the current day, current month, current year, because I've gotta spin through all of the months in the current year so that I can populate several months worth of historical exchange rates. So all this code does is loop through the months, and then what it does is, it, again, those last three lines at the bottom, it creates the data file, it FTPs it up to the website, and it executes the job to do the data load. Notice though that the string at the bottom, that's not JSON. That's where we couldn't get JSON to work with on-prem. However, if you use this string with a job type and the job name in row 230, it works like a charm with on-prem. Again, if I was using PBCS, I would probably use JSON and I'd use the provided function and the common helper functions. Sorry? Ah, the question was, where do you define the job name? Literally, you log into Hyperion Planning in the simplified interface, and I can show you this in a minute. Um, in fact, let's just do that real quick. <clears throat> so, I'm back in Hyperion Planning. I'm gonna go into the console, and let's say we're gonna define the job to do the import metadata. Um, I can go to Actions. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I'm gonna click to my Dimensions tab. I can say Actions, Import Data. I can hit the Create button. And this is where I tell it, okay, I want you to load from an FTP site, here's the file format, here's the file type, delimited, go find the file. And then when I say Save As Job, I give it a job name. And it's just stored in Hyperion Planning. You don't have to write code to create jobs. You just go into planning, create the job, and then you reference it from your code. We do the exact same thing to create our job. And here you can see my job is called load FX data. That's actually a, a job for loading the data, not the dimensions. But you just pre-configure it and then reference it with your code. I don't believe you can use the REST API to create jobs. I think you can only reference existing jobs. All right, just a little bit more code. I know, I know this is a fair amount. All right, so we've got our code to load our historical exchange rates. At that point, that's all the code you need. We just have to execute this thing. So, let's do it. I'm gonna pull up the Groovy console here. <clears throat> And by the way, um, it's not out there now. I have uploaded the slides, so the latest slides are on Schedule Builder. I'm gonna put this code in, uh, I'll make it available on my blog so that you can just download the code. You don't have to retype all this because it's in PowerPoint. 
And I'm going to go ahead and open up my code. Here it is. These are, this code is all the snapshots you've been seeing throughout the PowerPoints. And I'm just going to hit run. And I'm out of my fingers. And it did not like that. Connecting to the URL. Did I put a typo in this somewhere? Let's try it again. Line 118, what doesn't it like? I obviously messed something up. I literally ran this one hour ago. Yeah, I think I'm connected to the internet. Oh, you know what? I was connected to the internet. Thank you, K-Scope internet connection. Thank you very much, because I was about to flip out. Minor heart attack. Let's just make sure we can get to a homepage here. Try again. Oh, look at that, much better. So, yeah, thank you. Whoever said that, I owe you a beer. So what it's doing now is it's going through and it's cycling through, it did the dimension build, it slept for a little while, then it's cycling through all of the months, and we know we're in good shape because we got to the bottom and it said execution complete. So now, Let's just go back to uh, Hyperion Planning. And we're going to go back into our FX rate application, go into our plans. Now remember, this was empty before. Boom. We don't just have a handful of exchange rates. We have a ton of exchange rates. And you can literally, if you pay the right, you know, set up the right structure with open exchange rates, I think you can go get these like every second. So you can get real-time exchange rates for uh, well, everyone except Tonga, because that's a reserved word. So some final thoughts. And uh, by the way, thank you guys for sticking with me. Last presentation of the day. This is, uh, this is a better turnout than I expected. So some final thoughts. The REST APIs, honestly, they are a lot of fun. There are so many websites out there that have REST APIs where you can connect them to Hyperion Planning. I know a lot of people are doing work with salesforce.com. You can go out to Twitter, Google Maps. There's literally thousands of these websites. So there are a lot of opportunities to do some pretty neat things. I personally think that it's easier to work with PBCS than on-prem because some of the on-prem stuff was just a little trickier. Uh, and it just required a little more creativity. But like, like I showed you, it works. Even though it's not supported now, I do believe it will be supported soon. So uh, I, I think this is, if you've got 11.124, this is definitely on your horizon. And then the last thing is don't forget about those common helper functions. Those common helper functions are really, really useful. They are basically a, a lesson in how to code well. And they'll give you a really big leg up and a head start. So does anybody have any questions? Yes, in the front. Yeah, you're going out against more business-like applications like salesforce.com, HR websites, things like that, and tapping into those to build planning apps. So this is a fun, Fun thing. I mean, going out against Twitter would be kind of cool, but in reality, you're going to be connecting probably to more business-oriented websites. Now, I did see a great blog post out there about a guy that connected. Are you guys familiar with these penny auction sites, Bezid, things like that? A little bit scammy. So what he did is he wrote a REST API program that basically tracked every single bid on this thing, and he proved that Bezid 
well, first of all, he proved that there was, it was pure luck, that skill had nothing to do with winning these auctions. He proved that they were making thousands of dollars selling this, you know, tablet that cost a couple hundred bucks. And it, it was very interesting because you could see that people spent hundreds of dollars bidding on this thing and ultimately lost. And some guy that spent like 13 cents on bids happened to win it at the end just out of sheer chance. So you can connect to websites that probably don't want you scraping their data and go, go after it. I mean, it's really pretty fascinating stuff. Yeah, you don't have to call, you don't have to run this obviously from the console. You could, you could auto batch this up and automate it and just, just run the actual script. Yes? Yeah, I just ran it from the console, but you certainly don't have to. No, in fact, my credentials were stored in the code, but in reality, what I'd want to do is probably pass that in some manner, and obviously, you don't want to store your password in code. But yep, you can run those at a command line, definitely. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I mean, the question was, you know, from a security perspective, is it really a good idea to deliver the version of the API without any authentication required? I think it's pretty harmless. I mean, they do publish that information in the documentation as well. So, you know, I suppose that could provide a hacker with a little bit of context, but they're going to have to authenticate one way or another to get to do anything meaningful. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Yeah, so I think the question was, could you have multiple planning applications talking to each other? Yes, absolutely. And could you have planning talking to eBiz? I haven't, I haven't worked with the eBiz um, REST API myself, but I'm, I'm willing to bet if it doesn't exist now, it will exist soon. If you've got two REST APIs and two different products, you can make them talk, absolutely. Yes? Yeah, so I, I showed this slide before. Yeah, let me go back to that real quick. Yeah, that's the, honestly, that is the, one of the coolest things about all these REST APIs is the sheer number of languages you can hit. Because, I mean, you don't have to like the language that I like. You can use whatever you want. Come on. Here we go. All right, give me two seconds here. Whoa. So here you go on that one. I mean, there's just a ton of languages you can use. And these were the first, you know, handful that I found. But like I said, for most languages, I think you're probably going to find that there's a REST client out there somewhere. In fact, one thing I didn't talk about is there are add-ons for Firefox where you can just go execute a REST request from a browser without even having to write a bunch of code. So, you know, as long as you put in your authentication information, download one of the add-ons for a REST client in Firefox, and you can sit there and you can poke around these other websites and see, huh, I wonder what resources are out here and can I talk to them? I mean, it's really fun kind of going and probing some other website to see what kind of information you could scrape off it. And, and doing that through a browser with the Firefox add-on is by far the easiest way. Yes, Cindy. Really? Because I just uploaded it... Uh, this afternoon again. 
Okay. I'll let them know, and I will get it taken care of. And if it's not taken care of, um, in fact, glad you mentioned that. Let me uh, show you one more very important slide. Actually, two important slides. Um, don't forget that the EPM Carnival is tonight. And uh, that looks like a lot of fun. And then if you need to get a hold of me, you can either reach me through LinkedIn or Twitter, or please, please, please do hit up my blog. I like to think that it's reasonably interesting. So you'll see some other examples of how I've used Groovy to do things like compare outlines. If you would like to run Hyperion planning on your laptop like I am, there is a very, very detailed tutorial on how to do that. So hopefully it's something you'll find useful. All right, if you have anything else, come on up. Thank you guys so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>